Okay. A lot. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, even if you started with RC and you're now with final, uh, the natural answer would be there has nothing changed, but actually they changed a lot. So uh, they have changed a lot, but it's not so relevant for this talk, actually. Okay, I think we can start. Um, my talk is about building scalable user interfaces using Angular or with Angular. Although it's not so focused on Angular, it's showing a lot of technology-based uh, things with Angular, but I would say half of this talk is really about UI architecture. How do we build proper UI architecture with components? So I would like to start my talk with this question, why components? Why should we create components, right? We had user interfaces without components before, so why should we now create components? And to answer that question, I would like to tell you a small story. And this story is the parable of the two watchmakers by Herbert Simon. And the story goes like this. There were two watchmakers in a town, and both of them, they produced very nice watches, very fine watches. Uh, there was Hora and Tempus, and both of these guys, they produced really, really nice watches in, in one town. They were the only one in this town producing watches. And it was really running very, very well. So both of them, they received a lot of phone calls, and they had orders and produced watches, and they earned a lot of money with these watches. And at, so, at some point, someday, uh, Hora was still doing really, really well. However, Tempus uh, somehow didn't uh, really made a lot of money anymore, and his process kind of had issues. So he really went out of business completely. And after that day, Hora was the only one in town who was producing watches and make all the money, of course. So, okay, what do we get from this story? Uh, what do we want to know is why did Hora succeed and Tempus failed? And in order to find out, we need to look at the watch manufacturing process of both of them. So basically, we see, we look at the process of Tempus first. So Tempus watches consisted of roughly 1,000 parts, so a lot of different parts in this watch uh, watches. And his approach was to assemble all these tiny pieces piece by piece into one final watch. And there was a problem with this approach because you need to imagine that he's building this watch and getting phone calls at the same time. Sometimes these watches, they fall off the table while he's building them. And then the watch was bursting into thousand pieces, right? So he needed to start all over building these watches. Also, when there was a defect, he needed to go into the watch, find the piece, exchange this little piece, put everything to back together again. So it wasn't really working out so well. So let's look at Hora and what Hora did. Instead of putting all these... Th so his watches also consist of 1,000 parts, but instead of building all these watches of individual parts, he was building components, smaller components from these different parts. So he took a, a few parts, built a small component, and then he built larger components using these small components. And in the end, his final watch only consisted of about 10 large components. And what, when his watch fell down, when he was answering phone calls, uh, it only bur burst into, let's say, 10 components, which was great. Also, when he needed to do a repair job, he immediately knew that this is probably this component, so he just could exchange the whole component instead of taking the whole watch apart into pieces. And this is the really beautiful conclusion of uh, Herbert Simon, who created this parable. And the conclusion is complex systems evolve from simple systems much more rapidly when there are stable intermediate forms. 
And complex system in his stories is the watch, right? The watch is a really complex system. And stable intermediate forms are components, right? So instead of having all these tiny pieces into one system, you create smaller systems that work in a larger context, right? And this applies to nature, to economy, to uh, building user interfaces as well. But still, you might think, okay, that's a nice story about two watchmakers. How can this really translate to user interfaces, right? So let's look at this really famous UI uh, of GitHub. And we could try to reverse engineer this and build one page where we put an element, another element, and another element, another element, and we can add some more elements, elements, elements. You know, we could go on and on. And this does look familiar when you think about the watchmaking process of these two guys, right? This is exactly what Tempus did. Put all these individual elements onto one page, put all individual pieces into one watch, right? It's exactly the same. And we have learned that this is probably not the best thing to do. And this whole story is just about the reason why this is, right? So if we approach this more like Hora did with his uh, watches, then we could see this whole thing as one component. Then we have a smaller component. In this case, it's the navigation bar, let's say. And Inside the navigation bar, we have a search component where we then have the individual elements. Excuse me, I need to take a little bit of water. <clears throat> so, much better. Uh, this is actually a, a much nicer approach of building user interfaces. And the reasoning behind it is really that um, you can build a complex thing like a user interface much more naturally if you divide it up in stable intermediate forms or into components, if you like. So there are some commonalities between artificial and nature. And one thing is the scale. So if you look at this scale here, uh, you can see that we are going from very fundamental to very significant, right? So in nature, for example, an atom is maybe very, very fundamental, but an uh, organism is, is very significant. Or you can go further up, like planet, universe, multiverse, or whatever you want to uh, pick as a target. You always see that you have a scale from very fundamental to very significant. And the same goes for what we build, right? Artificial things like watches, but also user interfaces. And the key here is that you achieve a good distribution across fundamental and significant. You should not only have fundamental stuff and very fundamental stuff and very significant stuff. That is really not working out so well. And nature doesn't do this either, right? And that's exactly the problem, right? And that's what we used to do all the time. We created pages and loaded them with UI elements, right? We had huge pages, admin.php or something like this, for example. And we had all these user interface elements on this, on this page. And we didn't really think about creating uh, components and subsystems. Instead of putting all these elements onto one single page, we should really do something like here on the left. We, should, we need to build user interfaces that are wrapped into each other, create larger components instead of just putting elements on a page. So this is probably my number one advice for you. When you think about componentizing, don't think about reusability. It's the baddest habit you can have. That's usually our first thought, right? Oh, how can I reuse this? If I can reuse it, I will build a component. If not, I will not build a component, right? That's the wrong thought. You uh, should uh, only think really about simplicity. 
use simplicity as your, as your goal when creating components. You want to create a simple application. Let's take this example of a task list. So this is a very simple task list. You have a checkbox and a title, and you're going to list a few tasks. So if we look at the code of this, we could implement it like that, right? So we have a quite large template. Here is the ng4, right? So we are iterating here, which means this is actually the list, and this is already the task, right? The inner life of a task. And then we have this checkbox, which is a special checkbox. It looks a bit different than a regular HTML checkbox. So we have a label wrapper, style it a little bit different. We also have some logic here. And then we have the task title. So there are different concerns in this component, and I would really consider this as not really simple. This is not a simple component. So I would really not recommend to go uh, about implementing something like this uh, with this template. Instead, let's divide the responsibilities. We have a task list component. The task list component's responsibility is only to list tasks, not how a task looks like, right? What is the inside of a task is not the responsibility of a task list. Then we just render task components. And in the task component, there we are concerned about how does a to task look like and how does it behave like. And we go even that far that we say, our checkbox is quite complex because it's kind of a custom animated checkbox and we want to keep our code simple so we create a checkbox component and include it here. That's how the checkbox component would look like. So keeping it simple is, is really the key here. And the reason for this, there are many reasons and many benefits from this. One is that it really allows us to focus on our code. When, we, when one piece of code has only one responsibility, we can easily focus on that. And we are not very good on focusing, right? We can remember, I think, maximum of, or average of seven things uh, in, at one time, right? So we shouldn't really be concerned about all oh, the list and the, how it, the task looks like and the checkbox all at once, we should be able to focus on, on one layer, on one complexity layer. And that's uh, one, one big reason. Of course, we also enhance the fitness and ready for change or readiness for change and the overall flexibility because we create uh, these components. Let's talk about composition. Composition is, in my view, one of the most important things, not only in UI, but also in development, uh, in regular development, or if there is no UI involved. And I'm going to show you what I think are, are two key aspects of composition, or how you can view composition. There is what I call an intrinsic composition, and there is an extrinsic composition. So the intrinsic composition is when a component explicitly states he is consisting of some parts, of some defined parts. For example, my computer has a keyboard, right? So the keyboard is a subcomponent of the laptop, right? So this is intrinsic. It's motivated by the laptop that he has the keyboard, right? However, there is also another form of composition which I call extrinsic composition. And in that case, you are in your component, you're just opening up a free space where you allow stuff from the outside to be uh, inserted into your component, right? So how can we look at that? With an analogy, for example, we can see that extrinsic composition as an empty char component. If we think of a char, we can put something into the char, right? We have an empty char, we can put jelly into it or cookies, cookie components. Mm, I don't know, Did, was there any dessert during lunch? I didn't see any dessert. Yeah, it doesn't matter. So actually we can put anything we want into these empty char components. And that's what something like this with extrinsic composition would look like using Angular. Um, 
This is our char component. And within the template of our char, we have this ng content element. And this ng content element is just, it's like an anchor where we specify this is the location where we want stuff from the outside to be inserted or projected, and that's the term that comes from Shadow DOM, actually, content projection. And in Angular, it's the same term. They call it content projection. This is the place where we want to get stuff from the outside projected into our component. So if we have our app that is using a char, we can now, between the start and the end tag of our char component, we can put content, and this content will be projected into the char component. So this is a great tool if you do composition, because then you are very flexible. You can, for example, create components like this, a collapsible. A really simple component, but if done right, if done using extrinsic composition, your collapsible component is highly flexible because you can put into the component after you've built it whatever you want, right? So this collapsible, you just, it has a title, you click on it, it opens, you can click on it again, it closes again, right? Really simple UI component. This could easily be implemented like this using content projection in Angular. So here we are in the app component and we are using the collapsible component. We're passing a title input to the component, so we say that this is the title. And between the start and the end tag of our collapsible, we just put our content that we want to get projected into the component. So let's look at the collapsible itself. The collapsible consists of the whole logic when clicking the title that it kind of switches a flag if it's active or not. So this is just this toggling here. It has the title input, right, so that we can grab the title from the outside through an attribute or a property input binding. And then we have this ng content down where we want the collapsible content to be projected. So this is everything we need so that Angular knows how to project content from the outside into our collapsible. Preferred composition over bloating. And this is a really important one because I see this a lot of times. Projects start out very clean and then new, requ new requirements come and then people start to modify their components and they grow and grow and grow. And after some time, their compo components are really huge. And this is really a problem. And funny enough, I used the same example as Martin did in his presentation. Um, my example where we try to reverse engineer something is also the Gmail app. We didn't talk before about that, right? Uh, it just happened. So if we look at the Gmail application, um, we, and we try to reverse engineer that into components, we see some commonalities here, right? So if we focus on this area, we can see that all these, let's call them message items, they look pretty similar, right? Okay, we have some optional tags on the messages. Sometimes we have a time here. Sometimes we have a preview text or only a title, but they look very similar. So we could actually build one component to represent them all, right? So let's do that. Um, but before that, let's look at this one. So this is kind of an expanded message item, which shows you much more detail. It also has different behavior and even the layout is a little bit different. Yeah, let's keep that in mind. First of all, that's how we could implement a message item, right? A very simple template. We have a profile image, we have a profile name, a title, and yes, we have no semantics here, excuse me. Uh, it's just diffs, but for the demonstration, it's, it's fine. <laughs> um, yeah, so it's, it's really simple. And this is a simple component. Uh, there is nothing against something like that, except that it's not very semantic. Um, all right, so let's look at this problem again. Now we want to click on one of these items, and then it should expand in something completely different, right? Maybe it uses the same data, but it looks different. It behaves different. So how do we go about that? Well. 
the simple solution would be something like this, right? We just do an ng if, and then we have on the top, if this is not expanded, we just render how a message item looks like. If it's expanded, we render like the details looks like, right? And then we have our new message item component that can do both. It can expand, right? However, we are mixing responsibilities again. This is not how you should go about that. You should simply use composition. And then it's really, really simple if you think about it. Instead of creating or making our message item expandable with some details, we are creating a separate component for the message item, a separate one for the message details, and then we wrap both of these components into a wrapper component, which is called expandable message item. And there we just decide, should we display the message item or the message details based on that sta state, if it's expanded or not, right? It's really simple if you think about it, but we need to think more in this terms of solutions when we compose our application. Let's talk about data a little bit. And specifically, I want to show you something that you, Martin, also covered a little bit with web components. Uh, I like to see it as a kind of inversion of control. So let's look at an example. Um, this is a simple to-do app, uh, or not even a to-do app. It's just a listing app where you can add stuff. So in this case, it's a list of fruits you have a, a component around this list, which let's call it, it's our main component, it's our app component, right? The whole app is here in yellow, surrounded by yellow. So this main component, we could also call it a container, is keeping our data, right? So our data comes from this uh, container or our main component. And then we go a bit further down in the component tree, we have our list component. And the list component consists, again, of list item components. So now we are passing down the data from the container, this, let's say, the list, uh, the data list of fruits, we are passing it down to the list component, and the list component is passing it down to the list items. And then we have also behavior on this user interface, right? We have a clear list button that is part of the list, which is clearing the whole list. We have a new item add list uh, button, which is also part of the list component. And then we have this list item components, which show a title, but at the same time, it, they have the behavior that we can remove them from the list, right? So now if we looked at, at that in a hierarchy, we have basically our data container, our, con let's call it uh, container component, which is passing down data until it reaches the message item. But at the same time, and this is probably a little bit the mind shift, right? We are also passing the actions that were performed on these items, uh, on these components. We're passing them up again until they reach the data container. So let's look at that in code. Now we are on the list item component. So we have a title on the left side, and on the right side we have the remove button. So if we click on this remove button, we are calling a method remove. So now instead of performing some type of manipulation on, on data, when this item or this button on the component was clicked, the only thing we do is we tell our parent that there was a remove event, right? We just tell our parent that we are supposed to be removed. That's what we tell our parent. So we are in, that's an inversion of control, right? We're not executing the action, we're passing the action further up. So now we are passing this up to the list component. And on the list component, we are capturing this event on every single item, and then what we do is we're calling this remove item method 
for every item that was removed, and we are also passing an index of the item that was removed. So in our remove item method, what we are doing here is, again, we are not doing any manipulation. We are just re-emitting, if you like, that event. So now the list is telling its parent that the item at the index 5 was removed. Do, a, do something about it, right? And now, finally, we are reaching the app component, which at the same time is the data container. And here we are only catching this remove item event from the list, and then we do something about it. Because now we are in the data container, and the data container is responsible to modify data, to manipulate data. And now the good thing about it is that if we manipulate that data, after we manipulated it, this list here is maybe shrinked by one, and then we are passing this new list down to the component tree again, right? It's falling down to the list, and the list is rendering the list items, right? So this is really a unidirectional data flow. We have data going down, events going up, manipulation, data going down, and so on. This is really, really clean. So what does, uh, does it help to centralize your data? Um, it really, really helps because now we can reuse our, to our list in any kind of context. We can create a data container that is loading some data from a REST API, and then we can render it. We can pass it out data down. If there is a remove event, we call the REST API again, remove the item, get the new data, pass it down. But at the same time, we could use our list component to make the tutorial part of our application, and we just pass an array down to the list component. We don't connect it to any kind of, of service. So we can really reuse this now in, in all kind of contexts because we inverted the control. We reversed the control or inverse the control. All right. So let's talk about change detection. And this is not so easy, actually, change detection. And what I try to do here is really talk about the, the most important things. And I really try to visualize how change detection works in, in Angular 2. Or, sorry, Angular 4. <laughs> so first of all, what we need to understand is um, how is change detection triggered in Angular? At what moment does Angular do change detection? And for this, we need to understand the concept of asynchronous zones and zone.js. So asynchronous zones is a concept, I think, borrowed from other languages. Uh, I can't remember exactly from which. but there is actually already a, a standard proposal for zones in the browser, which is still in straw man state, uh, state zero, but uh, still there is a proposal. <laughs> so zone.js is no longer uh, a library, it's actually a polyfill. That's actually a cool trick. If you want to make a polyfill, just create a standard in straw man proposal and then create a library that does that, so you have already <laughs> done something. <laughs> yeah, so. It's not sure if this is going to land, but it's definitely a great thing. I'm going to show you what the problem is in this example. So here we are adding an event listener, a click event listener, to a button. And then when that click happens, we are starting a timeout of one second. After the timeout, we are fetching some data. And if that data is ready, we resolve it, so we receive a promise. We resolve the promise, and then we call console log to log the text that we uh, just got from, the, from this URL. So now the problem is when we, for example, have an error here at, at this console log, um, or when this promise uh, is resolved, then all we see on the console is the call stack that was executed here when the event started, right? That's where we where JavaScript knows this is the context. There is no way in JavaScript except then 
uh, closure, parent closures, but this is not really a call stack, this is a scope, right? Uh, there is no way for JavaScript to track to what asynchronous call stacks you have already been through to this point. There is simply no way. I think there is this async debug checkbox in Chrome. I have no idea what's happening there, but maybe that's an approach to do something like this. But here is what Zone.js does. It does crazy things. It will patch your whole browser. So when you include Zone.js, it will override add event listener for all event targets. It will override the promise, override the promise API. It will override set uh, timeout, add event listener. Everything in your browser will be patched. So it's kind of creating interceptor or proxies, proxy functions, so that when you add an event listener or when you add a callback, it actually intercepts this and puts a proxy as your callback so that it can be notified when this callback is executed and when it's done executing. And now here is the trick. If you assume you have one root zone and now it has intercepted all asynchronous operations, so that means that if this code is in your root zone and now you're calling an add event listener, it will create a subzone and then your callback will be executed in this subzone. So here we are in a sub or in a child zone. Let's call it subzone one. Then we have a timeout with another callback. This is intercepted or there is a proxy mechanism. And we have another subzone, subzone two. And then for the promise, we have another callback when we resolve it. This is the third subzone here. And now, since Zone.js has full control over this, if an exception is happening here, Zone.js can manipulate the exception and add the whole trace through all your zones where this exception originated from. So it can track that it was from a click that caused a timeout that caused an asynchronous request on the browser uh, to a server. And that's a really cool thing. And I think they should they should start implement this in the browser. It's really, really beneficial. So, okay. I can tell you also this. If you don't include Zone.js in your browser as a polyfill, Angular will not work. Not at all. It will completely fail. The reason for this is that they are using Zone.js for more than just debugging or error messages. They're using Zone.js to execute their change detection. And here is why. What do you think? Is it possible that your application data or state changes without an event? Is, is that possible? Can your application state change without an event? Like a click, like a server callback executing? Yeah? You think so? How? Yeah? Yeah, but it goes to the event loop. Okay. True. Yeah, true. Okay. It's not, I don't only mean DOM events, I mean set timeout, uh, index DB throwing something back, uh, any kind of soccer connection throwing events, right? No, it's not possible, right? So it's very clever. What they can do now is they can hook into the zone.js API and tell whenever there is a zone terminated, we do a change detection, right? Because that's the point where there is possibly a change. And there is no other moment when change can happen. And that's really smart, because then you don't have something weird like a digest loop that executes all the time or something like this. And you don't need directives specially just to tell Angular that after a click, there should be a digest. It's just that on any browser event, there is a possibility for change. So Angular will do a change detection for you. And here is a bit the, yeah, problematic part about it. 
by default, Angular thinks we are stupid developers. Really. Because this is the default behavior. By default, Angular checks every binding in your component's templates of every component on any event in the browser. So if you have 1,000 components in your application, then on every single event, there will be a change detection of every binding you have in your components, right? Imagine, this is a lot of binding checks, right? It, now, why, why is that? It, Angular is by default built on the assumption that you could modify the state of your application anytime. And you can modify, you can do weird things, right? I could grab a component that is completely somewhere else, modify some of its state at any event, and then this component there should actually update, right? Or I could put something in the window object, and then I can grab it with another event, I can grab it from another component and update my state, right? And Angular is by default set up that it works if you do crazy stuff like this, right? So if we look at that in a graph, it would look like this. We have a click event, and all our application components will trigger a change detection. So even if the click was here and you didn't modify anything, Angular will still do the change detection and evaluate the bindings to find out if there was a change. So now let's look at a concept called pure components. Pure components, they're built on a different assumption. Pure components are only changing if their inputs change. And this is coming from pure functions, right, in functional programming. If you provide the same input for a pure function, you will get the same output, right? That's the definition of pure. And in Angular, it's the same. With a pure component, if you provide the same input, it will render exactly the same, right? So it's only depending on its inputs, not on some connections to services, to data, anything like that, just what comes as an input binding into an attribute of the element, right? So coming back to our list item, uh, list component, uh, we have one input, item, which is a string. So we get that from the item attribute of this component. And then we are rendering this title, right, or the item, and we have this remove functionality with the remove button. What do you think? Is this a pure component? Yes? Yes, it is. If I change, if I don't change this item input, the title, it will look exactly the same. There is no reason we need to do a change detection. And that's just how we can achieve it to tell Angular that we are not stupid, right? And this is a component we think is pure. It only should change when the input changes. So we choose for this component the configuration change detection, change detection strategy on push. And by doing so, we tell Angular it should only detect changes when there are changes on the input. So taking our list as an example, we still have our root component, the data container. And the data container is not pure, right? This, it grabs some data from a service and then it renders all the components. It's not depending on its inputs. It gets the data from some services, from wherever. So we, we have this as yellow here. We don't, it's not a pure component. The rest of our system is now flagged as to be pure components. They only are depending on the input. So what happens when we have a click event? The click event is then dispatched to the parent and again to the parent, and then we finally land on the data container. There we are manipulating the data, and now since the data container is not pure, Angular will execute change detection because regular components, they will 
execute change detection on every browser event, right? So now we have the change detection there, which will cause the input for the second component to change, which will cause that input to change, and it will cause this input to change. But effect effectively, we have only the components doing a change detection that we are really interested in, where, where data really changed. So building pure, pure components is really import, important, and I think we should build as many pure components as possible. Make your components only depend on the inputs, and only if you know you need to have some external data, build a container and let the da data flow down into your pure components. So this is the last topic. Um, of my presentation is about the platform, the Angular as, Angular as a platform. Now, you could say Angular is universal. Um, it runs in the browser and it runs on the server and that's also where this universal thought came from actually, also with the initial approaches of isomorphic JavaScript. But I think Angular is a bit more because of its platform abstraction layer, Angular just runs wherever JavaScript runs, right? It doesn't, it doesn't need a DOM, it doesn't need anything else that it normally needs. You can emulate the platform however you want because you have this platform abstraction layer in between. By default, Angular comes with three platform types. It comes with a browser platform, which is the default platform. That is just rendering regular DOM elements, right? So you have your component tree and the template, and then Angular renders HTML uh, or DOM elements, right? Then you have a web worker platform, and the web worker is a bit special because there you have a restricted environment. You cannot do DOM operations in a web worker, right? It's this multi-threaded thing, right? So if you would give access to a multi-threaded thing to the DOM, you would actually have a disaster, right? So they don't allow DOM manipulation at all. So now there is really a platform you can just hook in. It's really simple to configure the platform you want to run Angular in. And then Angular is not depending on the DOM anymore, and you can run Angular in a web worker. Absolutely possible and with the breeze. And the final one, sorry, the final one is server. So in the latest version, they also built, have a built-in platform that runs on the server. So they're trying to do more than just the Angular universal package. They try to build a core platform that is available you can run uh, on a server environment, which is not only um, uh, which is not only Node.js, but also JavaScript environments like uh, Nashorn, right, or uh, the .NET uh, A ASP JavaScript something runtime. So, how about writing a custom platform? And this is actually not as difficult as it sounds. If you want to write your own custom platform you could simply start by implementing a so-called renderer. And in the renderer, you can implement the, the adapter or the abstraction layer that is manipulating DOM in the browser. Uh, but if you implement your own platform, you could do anything in these methods, right? You can see this should look quite familiar if you know the DOM API, right? And this is just an abstraction layer to the DOM API so when you implement it with something else, you can create your own platform uh, that you can do, basically you can use uh, Angular to render anything you like. So let's do a quick experiment. Um, we would like to create our own platform, which is not rendering HTML because HTML is lame. Uh, we want to render um, a graph on a canvas and our elements should be animated elements on this canvas, right? So we use uh, the canvas API. That's not a big deal. We just implement uh, our own platform with this renderer that I showed you and then we give it a go. So first of all, this is how the application we are gonna render with this renderer 
looks like. It's just a simple listing component, which is listing items. Every two seconds, there is a new automatically generated item added to the list. That's our application for the moment. It's a really simple application. So now we can import our custom platform that we just built. And then instead of doing a regular module, like this is how you build up a module in Angular, instead of importing the regular browser module, we are importing our custom graph browser module. And instead of doing a regular bootstrap of our application, we use our own platform to do the bootstrap. And that's actually what comes out. Instead of, and it's the exact same code as before when you saw the H1 with the list elements uh, appearing, exact same application code. We have just switched the renderer and now we are rendering a graph onto a canvas. So this is really a nice abstraction. Of course, this is very playful and experimental, but it just shows how flexible this platform is. So my advice here is just use the platform abstraction. And this is really important because you, sometimes you need to access the native elements in your application. For example, here, what we would like to do, um, we would like to, on our component, we also have a host element similar to the Shadow DOM, right? So on our host element, we would like to add an attribute data minus message with a value. So we can inject the host element by this statement here in the constructor. We can say at inject element ref, and that's basically the, the type for uh, our host element. And then we get this element ref, which is basically just a wrapper around uh, an element. It's an abstraction around the element in Angular. So now we can say we want to get the native element, and what's coming out here is just the DOM element. And then from the DOM element, we can use any API on the DOM element we like to use. So in that case, set attribute data message. So now the problem with this approach is that if we would run that in our canvas render, we would get an error. Because our canvas render doesn't have a native element that is a DOM element. In our canvas render, the native element is actually uh, a graph node, which is not a DOM object. And we would uh, have a problem here, because this node doesn't have a, a method set attribute. So never do things like this. When you access native properties, always use the platform abstraction. So instead of using the DOM API directly, we just inject this renderer that we saw before. We implemented one of these renders, right? We inject that as well, and then in conjunction, we can use the renderer and this element ref to set the attribute value. And now it doesn't matter on what platform you run, it will always be called through this platform abstraction. Yeah, so I think to finish up this presentation, I, I don't really think it's, it's the, the key message here is how Angular works, right? For me, it's really important that this whole component part of this presentation is, uh, should make the value of this presentation. I think we should all think about how we put our applications together and that we compose over bloat uh, that we prefer composition over bloating our UI components. Okay, so now a little bit of marketing. Uh, we're also um, having workshops very soon. So if you would like to join an Angular workshop with us, uh, we have one starting uh, for starters, uh, so who didn't do a lot of Angular 2 on July 23rd. And we have another workshop for advanced users where we do some advanced uh, topics, also composition, on July 26th. You can also use this discount code. So you, um, if you are from the Fox Days, you get a 10% discount. And also in August and September, there is the second edition of my book, Mastering Angular 2 Components, which by then will be named Mastering Angular Components because the version we don't trust <laughs> anymore. Um, so, yeah, if you're interested in that, uh, 
uh, yeah, come to me and we can talk about a discount or something, yeah. Uh, thank you so much. Yeah, and as far as questions go, please come to me. Uh, don't be shy. Come to me. Talk to me about Angular. I really like to talk about Angular. I'm really passionate about it. So please come by and, and talk. Thanks. Hey.